Well, originally this was last Sunday's message, but uh, we got delayed a week, and that's okay. Turning your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Kind of give you a little background of where we're going with this message, where I'm going with this message today. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is one of the most detailed descriptions of the Lord's Supper. It talks about being a memorial, but it talks also talks about preparation. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it, it, it talks about coming before the Lord in an unworthy manner. And it gives us some conditions and, and things and the preparation that wasn't being adhered to in that particular time. So we gave warnings, and the warnings were quite stern. In fact, if the warnings weren't heeded, it could result in, as the King James Version, they fell asleep or uh, many became sick. And we're talking getting sick or dying. So those are pretty grave consequences. But the verse that I want to want to focus on this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. This is one of those topical sermons where I'm going to take a verse and, and use it as a springboard to share some things from the Word of God, multiple different verses. But I'll ask you to stand as we honor the reading of God's Word this morning. The title of the message is A Time for Examination. The scripture says, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Father, we thank you for your word. And I pray as the Spirit speaks to hearts this morning, Lord, that anything's accomplished, it's because you're so good to us. You've given us your spirit and that you deserve all the praise and all the glory. I give you praise, glory, and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. A few months ago, I did a message of ex looking at ourselves in a mirror and what we saw in the mirror. And that's kind of an external look where we look externally at ourselves and then we do an internal evaluation. This one is focused not, not focusing on the outside at all. It's strictly focusing on the internal. Literally, it's, work, it, it's focusing on, on the heart. And that's, I, I believe, where the, the, the greatest amount of opportunity, the greatest amount of the Spirit of God given the ability to work is when we open our hearts and, and are willing to confront issues that we are challenged with and things that, that are in our deepest, innermost thoughts of the heart. Because when God really works in this, change occurs and not the kind of change externally where it's about methodologies or you know, it's ultimately about what God you what God is saying to you through the spirit of God so that you're willing to make changes that he would want to make you see externally if we try to change anything it's not going to last it just falls into the same category as a new year's resolution we might be able to do it for a week or a month or maybe even a couple of months, but eventually we all find that thing, life happens. And we get distracted and we lose focus. One of the things when we gather together for the Lord's Supper, it's a time to, to when we look for that examination, it's a time to take the focus off the external and to focus on the internal. And I believe that's, we don't need to wait every couple of months to do that. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that we're, we're to be renewing our, renewing our minds. And the only way that we're going to renew our minds is to do what? Is to examine. Examine what's in the heart. Go to the Scriptures and let the Spirit of God do some renewing. There's a lot of junk going on in the world today. It was just brought to my mind this morning that I didn't even know about it, that within a few miles of this facility, this church, they're, they're 
are going to be they're celebrating the opening of a Planned Parenthood center just 10 minutes away from here. And really, I can say it's in my hood because that's within a couple of minutes of my childhood home. So this morning, because the Bible says in Romans, in not Romans, in Ephesians 5, 6, 5, 16, it tells us to redeem the time because the days are evil. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to be better stewards and redeem the time that God has given us for His honor and glory. So four things. The four things this morning. Number one, this is a time for inventory. Inventory. The psalmist wrote in Psalm one thirty nine twenty three. He says, "Search me, O God." And that's that's talking. He's speaking right to this, right to the heart. And I believe, as you and I, as we take a spiritual inventory and allow the Spirit of God to really Exposed and peel away the layers in our hearts that he's going to find there's some work that needs to be done. And God is the one that can accurately and honestly do something in here. Romans 12, 3 reminds us that we're not to think more highly as we ought to think. But to do what? We're to think soberly. Soberly means right-minded. And when we have a clear mind, I believe the Spirit of God can speak to a heart. We have a clear mind. We won't miss the signs. We won't miss what the Spirit of God is trying to say. The only question is, what are we going to do when the Spirit does speak to this heart? What are we going to do? It's that same old adage of a free will. He can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. He can lead us in the path that He would want us to go, but we have to what? We have to be willing to follow. Remember the little, not really a fairy tale, but the little saying, most of us heard the little saying of little Jack Horner, huh? Sat in the corner eating a Christmas pie. But what did he say? One of the statements in that little little story is he says what a good boy am I and the Bible tells us what our, our righteousness our goodness we don't it doesn't we don't have anything within us that's good there's no righteousness that dwells within us it's only the righteousness of Christ as a child of God that's been imputed or given to us on a, that we're able to do anything righteous or good at all so as we think about the psalmist saying, search me, O God, and he does that, we have to be willing to say this part of the prayer that comes from Psalm 19.12, cleanse thou me from secret faults. See, when God peels away the, the, the layers of protection that we put around our heart and reveals truly what's there, dare I say it's probably not pretty. That old nature is still lurking in this transformed new heart, but there's still the the wickedness of the old heart still is in there. Wanting to somehow get out. So we're willing to pray, pray, cleanse me thou from secret faults. We're saying, God, do what you will. And and let me tell you, that, that can be a scary thing. Because as human beings, we want a little control. We want to be able to control the inventory that's in here. And if you say, ask God to change that, do something with it, you don't have control of the inventory anymore. But the one who, as we've said many, many times, God is good all the time, and all the time God is good, then we know that He's working in here going to be good it's going to be good a lot of us grew up with the little markings on the end of a door frame that showed your height as you grow and we we measure ourselves physically like we did as a kid but when we examine ourselves we're we're 
spiritually measuring ourselves. And we have to go by the standard that's in here. Not the standard of, I mean, it's wonderful to have a church family. It's wonderful to have brothers and sisters in Christ. But ultimately, the measuring stick has to be this book is what the Spirit of God is doing in here. Any other source, it can be a flawed measurement. You could take a tape measure and <clears throat> to the ground, but if you don't line it up perfectly, your measurement could be off. God has a perfect measuring tape. And He's willing to show you exactly where it's at. But He's also willing to show you what, exactly what you need to do about it. And how to... How to the, the, new, the, new, the new things of today are, are digital uh, measuring systems. And there's a thing, there's a calibrate button. And there's a zero button. God is the one that can calibrate. And God is the one that can set it to zero. So that then, then your, your, the measurements that you're taking are now accurate. Because let me tell you, if you want to re- read a tape wrong, you can do it. It doesn't take a mental giant to, oh, eh, it's close enough. But God is an exacting God. And when he's taking his inventory, it's a perfect inventory. And when he wants to make corrections, he makes the perfect corrections. Amen? So, in, in, inside of all that, number two, when you have an inventory, what do you have to do with it? You need to analyze it. So, number two, a time for analysis. So it's great we have all the, the inventory, the measurements. Now it's time to analyze the results. James 4.14 says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor, and appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. Taking an inventory involves more than counting objects. It's once you have an accurate inventory, an analysis is required to bring these things to bring meaning to the past meaning to the present and meaning to the future so all these needs are considered at the same time doesn't that remind you of God he has everything past present and future already done already done so you and I, as we look at this analysis, as we evaluate the past, the present, and the future, what's the one thing that comes into play? That four-letter word, time. Time. I preached a message just a little while ago about time, didn't I? Didn't I? Everything we do today is usually constrained, especially in the sports world. It's 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 revolves around time limits starting time and a finishing time what about us do we have a starting time and a finishing time absolutely God knows the day that you were born God knew the day you came to know him as savior God knows the day that you're going to go home he's got it all figured out so what does that tell us what does that mean well it means that we have only a God-given amount of time left. Whether it be physical death, this body given up, or the rapture of the church. Life for you and I might be clearer if we knew how much time was left on the clock. Would it not? You've always all heard the stories of someone who's, whose days are now numbered. Maybe they, they, they know that they're within a small window of time they're going to take their last breath and what do they do they reflect on the what the past they look at the present but then they live with gusts of the time they have left we're in the same boat we all have this illness called the dying body we should be living each and every day redeeming the time looking at the analysis and saying yeah I, I, I time is short we, Pastor Billy tells us we're in the latter days we know we're in the latter days because we see what's going on around us we need to live each and every day 
as it could be your last because it might be. The scripture tells us life is but a vapor and it vanishes away quickly. What are you going to do? Number three, after all this, we've taken an inventory, we do an analysis. Here's the one thing that we have as children of God, we have a reset button. So number three, a time for new beginnings. We've done the inventory. We've done the analysis. We can't say, well, it is what it is. Que sera, sera. No, it's a time for new beginnings. Philippians 3.13 says this so clearly. It says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which were behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. See, God knows our past. We've evaluated our present by looking in and doing an inventory and analyzing it. Then can we, as Christians, draw a line in the sand and say from this point forward, the answer is, yes, we can. We can. We don't have to let the burdens of the past affect what we're going to do in the future. We can acknowledge them, sure. Can't change them, no. But we can take that and move forward a new beginning that God would have us to do. Individually and collectively. I don't know about you, but if, if as, as I look at those things that are are there things in the past I wish I had never done, said, or thought? Uh-huh. Am I doing everything today? Is my is my analysis perfect? No, there's an analysis needed for a reason. But then there's, then what am I going to do with it? What am I going to do? What are we going to do with it? What am I going to do with it? Because the Bible talks about new things many, many times. First of all, what? salvation you have a new beginning you are a new creature a new creation that's where it starts but you also have this we also have the bible talks about in psalm 33 3 we have a new song that's a spirit of god living in here we have a new song we sing that song we have a new name there's a new name written up down in up in heaven, and it's what? It's mine. You went from uh, your name being a sinner, separated from God, to having your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You have a new name. You have a new spirit, as it says in Ezekiel. That old spirit, even though that old nature dwells within us, we have a new spirit because we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. It's only reserved for a child of God. No other human being on the planet has a new spirit. Only God's children. We talked about it before. We have a new heart. The Bible says the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? God knows it. And we do have a new heart. Even though it still has some of the old stuff in it, we have a new heart because of the Spirit of God. We live in the day of the New Testament, so we have a new covenant. The old covenant is no longer needed because we have a new covenant. We studied that in Sunday school, we and with Brother Joe, we have a new covenant. And one day we're going to have a new there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And we say amen to that. So there's a lot of new beginnings in the Bible. And you've all experienced as a child of God the first one. But there's nothing that says today you can't say, this is the day. Now, are you going to follow your... You make a new, new line, a line in the sand and you say that I'm going to follow this perfectly. Are you going to do it? No. No. But you've made a choice. You've made a decision that the status quo is no longer acceptable. The old patterns 
don't work. It's the de definition of insanity, doing the same old thing and expecting a different result. You want a different result, you're going to have to change. And number four, here's, here's the, the, the one thing that even though we've done an inventory, oh, even though we've done an analysis, here we have a new beginning, but the greatest thing that we have is that we have this is this is a time of hope a time of hope hope expresses assurance about the present as well as about the future on january 1st 1785 john wesley wrote this quote whether this be the last year or no may it be the best year of my life See, we're always, we need to be looking forward. We need to be anticipating what God is going to do. And I shared a little bit in the Sunday school. I had, I've had a tough couple of weeks. And I've, in my own fleshly mind and heart, said, boy, there just isn't a lot of hope. I feel like I'm beating my head against a brick wall. And the wall's winning. But then I'm also reminded that that's exactly what the devil wants me to think. So this this message is not only for you, it's for me. Because I'm human just like anybody else. I'm susceptible to the same kind of things that all people are too. You don't have a perfect pastor. I'm thankful that you, you are willing to, you know, to Pastor Appreciation Month, but <clears throat> not perfect. Never claimed to be, never will be. But here's a verse from Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 11 and 12. <clears throat> Talks about hope. But the land, whether ye go to possess it, it is the land of hills and valleys, and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. For the eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. And even we can take it one step further that the eyes of the Lord are everywhere from the beginning of creation to the end of time. The Bible tells us that, that Almighty God is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's been here for all eternity not going anywhere and the same thing goes for the hope that every child of God has a hope isn't going anywhere we can lose grasp of it absolutely we can lose sight of it absolutely but if we're willing to be going through the process of inventory examination new beginnings there's no other word that can come other than the word from that. Other thing that can come from that is the word hope. Hope can't be taken away from a child of God. We can give it up. We can willingly surrender it to some one or something else. But the God of all hope with the power of the Holy Spirit will dwell with every single child of God for, won't ever go away. You and I, as we think about time, think about evaluation, examination, you and I do not know the details of the future. They're, they're hidden and unknown to us. But they are known by Almighty God. And the insur assurance of Jesus is that we do not need to be anxious for tomorrow. It says that in Matthew 6.34. Do not be anxious. Don't worry about your future. God has the future of every one of His children in his hand. We're going to close this morning and we actually will close a little early. 
<clears throat> with the song, The Solid Rock. When we consider examining ourselves, we think about the inventory, we and then analyze the results, we have a new beginning if we choose to make one. We have the hope for all eternity. The one thing that we, every child of God has is a foundation that will never crumble. You see, tragedies happen all over the world, especially with earthquakes, with mudslides, all these physical disasters that can happen and just wipe everything out in its path. But there's something that we stand on that no force in the universe can touch it. No, you, no force in this universe can touch it. And that's the foundation of Jesus Christ. Which every child of God has. Your foundation is the same as my foundation. It doesn't matter what, where, where you stand on this planet. If you're standing on the solid rock, it's the same for all of us. No degrees. No degrees. So as we, we close this morning, we're going to sing that song solid rock I'm even going to steal a little brother R's thunder so you, as we sing this song I'm even going to ask the pianist to go a little slow on that so that that the words of it sink in of how secure your foundation is as a child of God but the song does re- re- make a reference to sinking sand if you're not a child of God. Your foundation is unsure. Your foundation won't hold up. It'll be like sinking sand. But here it is. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. God gave us a free will. He gave us the Spirit of God to speak to our hearts. And if I'm going to put it out there, If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are on shaky soil that will not stand. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. If you're not a child of God, there's probably nothing holding you back other than yourself. I think we've all were resistant to the, the gospel of Jesus Christ before, B.C., before Christ. But once that day occurred, once the Spirit of God finally broke through this stony old heart, and we realized that everything that the Word of God says is true about who I was. But in Christ, He now tells me who who I am and whose I am. No better place to be in in the world that's going the way it's going. Because regardless of what happens on this world, the solid rock of Jesus Christ is still solid. Amen? Amen. Oh, it's Brother Art to come as he we prepare for this song. and Pay attention to the words, because as a child of God, this is your story. This is my story. Because the songwriter wrote it, and it came right out of the Word of God. That's hymn number 125, 125 in the red hymnal. I invite you to stand. In fact, I'll ask you to stand. One of the things that dawned on me as the pastor was talking about this song,